Blog Talk Radio. Mi chamo apura kanu apura kaitnu ne ye ojira da me dinde ojira po kwisi ranehm pata akan akwamu mai amaruka etipi mu ojira po ojira mai mu. Greetings to all apura kani apura kaitnu meaning Africans, Black people. Today is ojira day, purification day. My name is Ojira Fo Kwesi Ranehm Pata Akan. Ojira Fo the Akwamu Nation in North America within Ojira Mai, the purified nation, Apurakani, Apuraikaitni, people in the Western Hemisphere. Yet I say we thank you once again for tuning into the broadcast. This is a special broadcast. Ahasa in the Akan language means 300. This is our 300th broadcast on Blog Talk Radio. So we want to focus on specific institution building efforts that we have been engaged in since we first started our broadcast back in May of 13,014. We're dealing with Amanie, nationism, the purification of nationalism, and nationism rising. We have four broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akan Bo Nanasom, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestry Religion, on Joda on Monday nights, where we deal specifically with the Akan expression of Nanasom, of Ancestry Religion, first and foremost because we are Akan, secondly because of the misinformation being propagated regarding Akan cosmology, Ancestry Religious Practice, the nature of the Abosom, the deities, the nature of the Nananom and Samanfo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, the nature of Inyamewa and Inyame, the great mother and great father supreme being, the nature and function of Inyonkumpon and Inyonkumpon, the creator and creator trust and so forth. Misinformation not only coming from individuals in the Western Hemisphere, but for those individuals in Ghana, Ivory Coast, and on the continent of Afuraka, Afuraikai, Africa, who have been infected with white culture, white pseudo-religions such as Christianity and Islam and various other expressions of white perverse culture and misinformation, miseducation through universities and so forth because of the misinformation that has been woven into the fabric of the culture. Their presentation of our kind ancestral religion has been infected and they pass that infection on. So we deal with ancient, authentic our kind ancestral religion. We deal with our ancestral origins in ancient Kanat, the Khan land, ancient Nubia, where we migrated from ancient Nubia, ancient Kanat, after the fall of Kemet in northern Kanat a couple of thousand years ago. Some of our people left those regions. Some stayed, but some of our people left those regions and migrated west, reestablished ourselves and reestablished the Kanat Empire in the western part of the continent, the Ghana Empire, about a thousand years later, because of Muslim invasion, some of our people mer- migrated further south into the savannah and forest belt regions and reestablished Akana civilization in those regions. Hundreds of years after that, some of our people were taken from, north, from that region into North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during the Musuo Kessie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. And this is how we ended up in the Western Hemisphere. However, we maintained our ancestral religious tradition. In South America, Suriname, the Akan tradition is called Winti, from the Akan term Huinti. In Jamaica, the Akan ancestral religion is called Obia, from the Akan term Obai. In North America, in the United States, the Akan ancestral religion is called Hudu. We call it Hudu from the Akan term Undu, meaning medicine from roots, trees, plant life. This is where we get root work from. Undu also means to become heavy, heavy with the spirit, through spirit possession, spirit communication. We also call the ancestry religion Kanje or Kanja. This comes from the Akan term Kanche, meaning to utter incantations to bring the spirits of the Abosom and Nananom and Samanfo forward. We maintained our ancestry religious practices and we were thus empowered and guided by the Abosom and Nananom and Samanfo, our deities and spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of our direct blood circle to wage war against the whites and their offspring, raising up metal armaments as well as chemical and biological warfare, root work being the precedent for that. 
and we were able to force the end of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere. So we deal with ancient, authentic Akan ancestry religion born of our direct spirit genetic blood circles and so forth. On Egoa Marketplace Day, which is our Wukuda Akuada Wednesday, we showcase Afurakani, Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions. Those who serve the Afurakani, Afurakani community in a positive capacity, those who maintain their ancestral religious values in the context of their service, and therefore it informs their service to the community. We have individuals come on to the show. We also deal with the philosophical foundation for economic development rooted in our ancestral religious values. We have thus published the Okom Economic Development Model, which is an approach to economic development rooted in and thus animated by our ancestral religious values. Thus, we have a holistic approach to economic development. On Yauda Thursdays, it's called Yada and Abada. We have Amain Sim Affairs of the Nation. We deal with issues that are confronting us as an Oman, a nation, but specifically as Ujira Man, the purified nation of Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. Because we have been drawn into this Western Hemisphere forced migration through the Musuo Kesie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. We follow the direction of our Nanano Nsamampo, our spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, and the Yaboso, the forces in nature. And therefore, we coalesce in a specific region of the Earth Mother's body. In this region of the Western Hemisphere, we are directed to blend ancestral blood circles to bring ancestresses and ancestors black back through these blended blood circles. We interface with the Earth Mother divinities in, their re- of this, in this region of their body, this unique expression of their energy in this region of their body in the Western Hemisphere. We interface with the plant life, animal life, mineral life in this region of the Earth Mother's body. We interface with the unique expression of the Abosa and the Orisha, the Vodou, the Ntoru, Ntoru to the divinities as they manifest in this region of the Earth Mother's body. And we take that unique expression of energy into our being. We take in the plant life, animal life, and mineral life in this, from this region of the Earth Mother's body into our being for food as well as medicine. We interface with the Earth Mother divinities, and we blend ancestral blood circles in the co- coalition or coalescing and confluence of these events allows us to forge a locative identity, a unique identity, an expression of ancestral identity, and thus ancestral religious practice and ancestral culture which is rooted in our locative identity. We just have, therefore have an expression and therefore an approach to solving problems that is unique to our locative identity. We recognize that the Omain, the nation, is a living, breathing entity made up of cells, which are Afurakani, Afurakani people. We're children of a greater organal structure, which is the nation, the Omain, and just like an organ is an entity that serves the greater body, which is your greater body, The organs within the great divine body of the supreme being serve the greater being, Nyamewa, Nyamewa, Aminet, and Amen, the great mother and great father of the supreme being. The cells are children of the organs. The organs are divinities in and of themselves. The cells are children of those divinities of that organal structure. When they interface with one another, work interdependently as cells, they maintain their balance and so forth, and they execute their function. At the same time, they must support the functions of the overall organal structure of which they are a component part of the energy complex that governs that organ. And Omain, a nation, is a living, breathing entity governed by specific Abosom, Orisha, Vodou, and so forth. And we as cells, as part of that unique organal structure, that collective of cells and so forth, we interrelate with one another as Afurakani, Afurakani people in that collective, interdependently, harmoniously, but we also serve the organal structure of which, we, of which we are a component part and the divinities that govern that organal structure as well. So there's a spiritual foundation to our approach as nation building, nation building individuals. When we talk about Amaniye nationism, this is what we're talking about, the purification of nationalism, an approach to nation building, Amain Sesu nation building restoration rooted in our ancestral religious values with the proper definition of what an Omain and nation is. So 
So that's what we deal with on Amain Sim Affairs of the Nation. Tonight is Binada, Abinada, and we have our broadcast, Ojida, which means purification. And when we first started broadcasting on Blog Talk Radio, the broadcast was Ojida, purification. Ojida means purification. It also means to celebrate a ceremony of purification. That is the definition as you find it in the language of ancient Kanid and Kemet, as laid out in the Medusa, the so-called hieroglyphs. You also find that Jida means purification. Jida also means to celebrate a ceremony of purification in the Akan language. So we have the same term with the same vocalization, same ritual meaning. In this broadcast, we deal with ancestry religion in general, not just the Akan expression, but ancestry religion in general, no matter where we exist on earth, whether we're in Afuraka, Afuraka, or those of us in the Western Hemisphere, wherever Afurakani, Afurakani people are, ancestry religion impacts every aspect of our lives, and this is what we deal with on the Ojira broadcast. Ancestry religion, or Nana Som, as we call it, Afurakani, Afurakani, or African ancestry religion, no matter what form it takes, in essence, is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. That means through ritual, we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual, we reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and thus realign our Selves with divine order. So the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance, these are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion. We state that Ojida purification operationalizes Nanason, ancestral religion. Purification operationalizes our practice of ritually incorporating law and ritually restoring balance. We seek to align every thought, intention, and action with divine order every moment of every day so that as we execute our divine function in creation as cells within the great divine body of the supreme being executing the function as cells that we were designed to execute fulfilling our role in creation in the great divine body we seek to align every thought intention and action with divine order every moment of every day this is our amamre this is our way of life. This is our culture, the Afurakani, Afurakani people, the divine acceptance, the law, the love of order, and the divine rejection, the divine hate of disorder. We accept that which is harmonious, and we reject, repel, and destroy, and eradicate that which is disharmonious and is pervasive. This is how ancestry religion impacts every aspect of our lives when we seek to align every thought, intention, and action with divine order every moment of every day. And when we make legitimate mistakes, we engage the ritual process to ritually incorporate divine law and ritually restore divine balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions. So for Ojira, we purify concepts, purify the understanding of cosmology, purify the understanding of ritual practice, and so forth. It is through this purificatory process, even when our people were forced to Western Jews. Best means by which to wage war against the whites and their offspring through raising up, as we said, metal armaments, utilizing chemical and biological warfare through the practice of root work, waging war, the hoodoo wars, the Gullah wars, and so forth, which forced the coming into being of, of the civil war and forcing the end of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere. This is our inheritance. This is our spirit genetic inheritance. This is our transcarnational inheritance. So this is our 300th broadcast. So we want to go into some detail about our institution-building efforts over the past few years since we began these broadcasts. In 13,014, we passed into 13,018 in September, on September 22nd, which was our New Year's Day, the first day of 13,018. Of course, we do not track time based on a fictional cartoon character who never existed of any race or in any form, Jesus, Yeshua, and so forth. Nothing happened 2,000 years ago. We are in the midst of a 26,000, I say, Kessie, great year cycle, hence the beginning of the years of 13,000. And of course, we are in the Fourth, into the fourth month 
of our actual real calendar. But we started back at the end of May of 13,014 with the OG, first OGDA broadcast. We want to talk about the progress of our institution building efforts and talk about the trajectory of those efforts into the future. At the time that we started the broadcast, we had just begun to publish once again the soft cover versions of our books, and we started off with the first seven books, and then after that, a few months later, we released the next three, and then later in the year, we released three more, so we got up to 13, and eventually, when we, from the time we started broadcasting, we had seven publications, seven books, and now we have 29 books out, and we have more coming out very soon within the next month or so. We have many more books coming out. The 29 books are just a summary of the information that we have uh, to put forward to the community. So when we deal with these 27 books, if you go to our publications page, we want to show some distinctions with regard to what we put forward, what we are bringing to the Amain, what we're bringing to the nation. As Apurakani, Apurakani people, there are distinctions, there are specific things we have put forward that are transformative that are moving our people forward in consciousness and understanding, and therefore in this notion of Amaniye nationism, the purification of nationalism, the so various concepts, approaches, analysis, and so forth that impact every aspect of the lives of Afurakani, Afurakani people when understood. We want to show the distinctions regarding what we are doing and what others are doing so we can understand the differences, so we can understand the value of what we have been working on and putting forward. If you look on our page, the Nhoma page, the publications page, you'll see the 29 books laid out. Of course, we publish the soft cover versions of our books. We do the research, the writing, editing, the completing of that process, the publishing, the printing, the shipping. We do all of that in-house on our own printers in color and so forth. We do not contract that out to a third party. We do, while we sell the soft cover versions of our 29 books, and they range between $8 and $11, we've made the ebook versions of our 29 books, and the ebook versions are the full book. They're not just a truncated version, they are the full text. We've made the ebook versions of our 29 books available. Afurakani, Afurakani people, it's free downloads from our website. So if you do not have any funds, you always have permanent access to all of our publications for free simply by downloading them. Of course, the same is true of all 300 of these broadcast archives. You can access them at any time for free. They are all on the, our YouTube, our Blog Talk Radio channel, and many of them are also, in addition to being on the Blog Talk Radio channel, which you can access at any time, they're also on, many of them are also on our YouTube channel, our OGDAFO YouTube channel as well. So whether you go there or you go to the Blog Talk Radio channel, this channel, you can always access them. The books are free. We recognize the reality, which is a distinction with regard to our nation building and institution building efforts. We recognize the reality that the information that we have published is essential. It is not simply something that can be uh, tossed around or just decided, well, maybe I'll check this out, maybe I won't. The information is essential to our growth and development. And because it's essential to our growth and development, because it's purificatory, dealing with that theme of Ojida, purification, we have to make the information free and accessible to our people here in the Western Hemisphere as well as all around the world. Many of our colleagues, would never make their publications, their books and so forth, free publications online for fear that they would never be able to generate revenue and never be able to, you know, uh, take care of themselves financially if they made all of their publications free. In contrast, we make all of our books free because we recognize the reality that the information is too important to hold ransom. In the same fashion, all of the presentations that we do in different cities, all of our conferences, we always stipulate that they are free of charge 
and whenever people attend our conferences and our presentations, no matter what city we're in, not only do they come to a free presentation, but we also give away a free copy of one of our books to everyone who attends, and of course, the only people who are allowed to attend are Afurakani, Afurakani people. We've given away over 1,500, 1,600 soft cover books at different events for free to the people who have come out recently. So when you look on the Nhoma page, the publications page on our website, you'll see the list of our books. And we want to go through and point out specific things in different publications that are unique to their approach to institution building and knowledge sharing that we're talking about. We have to show what we're bringing to the O mind so we can understand the value of the work that's being done. The first book you'll see is Kukutun Tum, The Ancestral Jurisdiction. In the Kukutun Tum, we establish the cosmological foundation of creation. We start off talking about Amin and Aminet, Ra and Ra'et, Ka and Kayet, the origin of the term Afuraka. Afurai Kayat, the land Ka of Afura, the creator, the land Kayat of Afurai, the creatress, the origin of the term Africa, and so forth. We deal with that cosmological foundation. We start off talking about the balance of male and female, Amen and Aminet, Ra and Rayat, Ka and Kayat. We also deal with Ma'a and Ma'at, the male and female forces of divine law and balance, and so forth. We show that foundational balance of the great mother and great father supreme being that permeates all of existence, restoring the consciousness of the complementary opposites of the great mother and great father, and that manifests itself throughout creation. If we don't understand that foundational relationship of complementary balance, then we will be always imbalanced and typically imbalanced towards the male side where the female is being inferiorized in every aspect of culture. So we started that process, and when we published the Kukutun Tum, when we first released it, of course, that's the first thing that people notice about the text. The next thing they notice is the explanation of the cosmology and the unfolding of creation in a systematic fashion. They understand that Afuraka Afuraka is the origin of the term Africa. We are the first to properly identify these terms and show that Afuraka is the origin of the term Africa. No scholar, black or white, has been able to show that, specifically dealing not only with the nature of Afura, the creator Ra, manifesting through the Afu, the flesh, and also um, Af, Afu, Afu, meaning house or place of residence, but the term Ka not only means soul, the female term Kaet, meaning soul, but Ka and Kaet are also the male and female terms for a raised land, a high land, a land above the surface of the river, the first land that rose up in primordial times from the primordial waters to become the first land mass of earth, the first land upon which Rod and Riot operated through to create the world. We showed that information to show the relationship of that first raised land, the first Ka and Kayat, which is different from Ta and Tayat, a flat land or a flat plain, but Ka Kayat, the primordial raised land or high land, mountain land, and so forth. We show the union of Afura and Ka, Afura moving through the Ka, moving through the first landmass, Afura moving through the first landmass. We are able to show not only linguistically, but cosmologically the origin of the term Africa, which no scholar, black or white, has ever shown. That's in the Kukuzun Tum, and then we later go into more detail in the, in the following book. Then in the Kukutun Tum, after we established the cosmological foundation of creation and our relationship with the deities, the ancestral spirits, the nature spirits, and so forth, the recognition of the divine law, which is the expression of order, then we get into the fictional cartoon characters who never existed, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Solomon, Sheba, Menelik, Moses, Aaron, Jesus, Yeshua, Yeshua ben Pandera, Muhammad, Buddha, Brahmin, all of these fictional cartoon characters. Many people understand that the story of Heru with Osar and Oset was used as a foundation or a template when they were manufacturing the fictional cartoon character Jesus. 
They don't understand that Chen Su Neferhetep Heru is where they took the name Chen Su, so Yeshua, Yeshua, Jesus from, and the healing practices of Chen Su Neferhetep Heru is where they got that, the healing practices of the fictional Christ walking around and so forth. They don't understand the relationship between Heru, son of Asar, and Asedin, and Chen Su Neferhetep Heru, the son of Amen and Mu. We show that connection. We show the actual origins and the cosmological foundation of the story of Alsara set in Heru had manifest in the stellar region, the solar phases, the lunar phases, manifesting on Earth, manifesting in the different organs and systems within your body, and manifesting within the different divisions of your spiritual anatomy. And we show that with the various deities in creation on every level of existence, we show how these stories, narratives play out consistently. We properly identified the fictional cartoon character Jesus. There was no black Jesus. There was no white Jesus. There was no black Jesus in the Talmud. There was no black Jesus in the Quran. Never existed at all. We make that distinction. When you look at Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, we show the actual etymological origins of these names, showing that Tehuti, Heru, and Set, and Iprahi, Shek, and Smaiur, were corrupted into Ibrahim, Ishek, and Ismail, or Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael, and so forth. We are the first to show these proper etymologies. Some of our people are following white scholars like Gerald Massey and other scholars who are misrepresenting this information, putting forward false etymologies based on a lack of understanding of cosmology and misrepresenting the origins of these fictional characters and the names and, and cosmology and so forth. The same is true with Moses and Aaron. We show the connection between Ma'asher, the title of Tehuti becoming Moshe or Moshe, and Moses and Aran, Aran being that the baboon, which is the assistant to Tehuti, also the divinity Ma'a, but called Aran in the book of the Cow of Heaven, the assistant to Moshe or Moshe, Moshe becoming corrupted into Moshe and so forth, so forth. Moshe and Aran becomes Moses and Aaron and so forth. We show the fictional Solomon, Sheba, and Menelik talking about Asara, Set, and Heru operating through the star systems of Sa and Sapatit or Orion and Sirius. We are the first to show that the fictional cartoon character Muhammad comes from the name of the divinity, the spiritual force, the male deity who operates through the waters, Mu, of Hap, Met, Hap, the Nile River, of Met, the north. Hop, Met is the northern now. Hop, Met, and Hop, Reset is Hop of the south, the southern Nile divinity. Hop, Met, or Hopi of the Met, Hopi of the north, the northern Hopi, the northern Nile river, is the spiritual force that the white Nile spring corrupted into Mu, Hop, Met, the waters Mu of Hop, Met, the northern Nile became Mu, Hop, Met, or Muhammad, and they ran with that, manufacturing that characters of white Arab walking around on earth when it's talking about the spiritual force that is animating the river as we speak. We are the first of any scholar, black or white, to reveal that information. People didn't pick up on it until we published it, and then they began to study it themselves. And of course, the same is true of Buddha and Pata and Brahmin and Per Amin and so forth, and we go into detail about these various things. These fictional cartoon characters who never existed in any form or of any race whatsoever. We destroy Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hebrewism, Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, Hermeticism, pseudo esotericism, all of these foolish practices that the whites and their offspring put forward and some of the brainwashed amongst our community who think that they're metaphysical or think that they're engaged in some kind of esoteric um, ritual practice and trying to teach people Kabbalism or teach people Hermeticism or teaching people Taoism or teaching people Jainism or teaching people these pseudo-esoteric, uh, perverse, non-sciences or ritual practices, we destroy all of that with the Kuku Tum Tum and expose the fact that they never left the building of white pseudo-supremacy. So that's the value of the Kuku Tum Tum. And, of course, when you check out the book, it came out as a three-CD set at first, and then we published the book version with additional information, you'll see those details. We have the Ubin Shang, the Ancestral Summons, which the 20th anniversary of that was 
this past December 21st, first book that we released. It deals with the ritual practices and the functionality of ritual practices that we utilize in ancestral religion. Anything we engage in, whether it's libation, ritual song, ritual dance, ritual prayer, talisman, amulets, whatever we engage in, we're always receiving, processing, and transmitting energy and being empowered consciously by the forces of nature and the ancestresses and ancestors as we engage these practices. If we're not receiving, processing, and transmitting energy in a measurable fashion, a quantifiable fashion, we do not engage in ritual practice. Every ritual practice we engage in has substance. We do not engage in symbolic gestures like the Catholic Church and so forth and other pseudo-religious practices. We don't engage in symbol without substance. Every ritual practice we engage in has functionality, has ritual validity, that energy can be measured and transferred. This is what we engage in. We, we uh, document that in the Uben Shang. In our book, Afuraka, Afurakai, the origin of the term Africa, as we said, we are the first to prove conclusively that the term Africa comes from the masculine term, Afuraka. We are the first to show and the only to show Afrika and Afraka in the Medutu, in the hieroglyphs of ancient Kemet, in the Pert Imheru, the so-called Book of the Dead, in the Temple of Paraka, or so-called Phile, in southern Kemet, with not only the term, but also within its cosmological context within these texts. And, of course, we show those actual Medutu on the front page of the book, one from the papyrus of Hunefer, one from the Temple of Paraka, so-called Phile, in Southern Kemet. We show that the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, that organization, when they put forward seven possible definitions of, and origins of the term Africa, from the Phoenicians and from the Romans and from the Greeks and from the Hindus and from um, the Arabs and these different possibilities of where the term comes from, we show, number one, that all of those seven possibilities that they put forward None of them are the origin of the term Africa. Moreover, we show, for example, the term parika, or parika meaning land of fruit in Phoenicia. We show that pari is the, coming from the term pari. Pari means fruit or produce in the language of Kemet. The term apara, meaning that which comes after in the Hindi dialect, and they're saying that Africa comes after India, so it's called Apara, which became Afara and Aparaka and so forth. We show that not only is not, that not the origin of the term, but Apara comes from Pera in ancient Kemet, and Pera means progeny, those who come after. When you talk about Afri, meaning not cold, we show that Afri in, our, in ancient Kemet means to boil, hot, vapor, and so forth. When they talk about Afri in uh, Latin amongst the Romans, talking about the sunny land. We show that Frey, Afre, in Coptic being the title of Ra and so forth, pronounced Afre and so forth. The whites and their offspring believe that Ra is the sun god, not understanding that Aten and Atenit are the male and female sun divinities, and Ra and Ra use the sun and other stars to transmit their spiritual energy. But when they saw we said Afre or Frey, talking about the sun, as an euphemism for a Ra, they said Afri, meaning the sunny land and so forth. We go into detail to show not only are these different terms that they thought came from the Phoenicians, the Romans, the Greeks, the Arabs, the Hindus, and so forth, with these very definitions, not only are they not the origins of the term, but we show that every one of those terms actually don't come from those languages is we actually show those terms in the Medusu, in the hieroglyphs, with the same meanings they have in these various languages, showing that all of those terms were taken from those groups of people from our language. But then we also show the origin of the black Berbers, the original black Berbers who are Afri people, Afari people. These are ancient Kanitu living in south of Kemet, some moving into Kemet, some living west of Kemet and so forth for thousands of years before the White Snarl Spring invaded North Afuraka, Afraka, and polluted the blood circle of certain people and created a mixed population in certain areas. We had the original Kanitu 
the original quote unquote Nubians and so forth. These are the Afari people, Afarik people, Africa people, Afuraka people, Afuraikai people. We show that um, Ra'et is called Afurayet. She becomes Afrayet or Afrayet or Ifri amongst the Berbers and so forth. They call her a sun goddess and a cave goddess. When she's moving through the sky, she's Ra'et. When she's moving in the underworld, she's Afurayet. Just like when Ra is moving through the sky in the sun boat, he's Ra in the form of the divine falcon. When he's moving in the underworld in the night boat, he takes the form of the flat horn ram. He's called Afu, Ra, and so forth. We go into detail about that. This is why she's called Dea Africa or the goddess Africa. We go into detail about all that. We are the first to prove conclusively, and it is irrefutable, that the term Africa comes from Afraka, and nothing anybody says can change that reality. Next, we deal with Marenechi, divine law, love, and divine hate. We show that the terms law and love are the same term in our ancestral religious culture and practices. In the Coptic dialect, for example, the term for love, desire is meh. The term for law in Coptic is meh. Law and love is the same term and same concept. When you're in love with someone or in, you're actually in law with the individual, meaning your interaction with the individual is reflective of divine order. It is an expression of divine order. When you're a loveful relationship, it's a lawful relationship. We show the connection between LV and LW, the consonantal structure of those words. The letter V, which was taken from our ancestral language and script because the White Snarl Spring never had a script, whether it's Arabic or the Latin script and so forth, or the so-called Semitic scripts, they all come from our original script. The White Snarl Spring never created a script. So that V sound and symbol started off as a V sound a few hundred years later, over a thousand years ago, the V evolved into the U. A few hundred years after that, the U evolved into the double U, which is two U's side by side, W. But it's also written as two V's side by side. This is why V, U, and W are used interchangeably in European languages. You have Sweden, S with the SW sound. Some pronounce it Sweden with a V. You have William which is with a W in certain European songs. There's Wilhelm with a V and so forth. That LV and LW, love and law, is the same word, even phonetically, even though it's corrupted in the language of the whites and their offspring, you still have love and law. Love and love is the same consonantal structure because it points back to the reality that meh and meh, Law and love is the same word and the same concept in reality. When the whites and offspring are talking about falling in and out of love, they're really talking about falling in and out of lust. We show that law, you can't fall in and out of law because law is actually a male and female deity. We're talking about ma'al and ma'at. The male divinity of divine law is ma'al. The female divinity of divine law is ma'at. They are the expressions of divine order. And, of course, hate is heterobedet and uh, Sechima, Sekhmet, the contractive forces of divine order. So you have the expansive pole of divine order, which is law, the expressive pole, and you have the contractive pole of divine order, which is divine hate, the uh, impressive pole. We express order and impress order. We expand and we contract. Through law, the divine order is laid out and established and so people can utilize it as an instrument to restore balance to their lives. Through divine hate or contraction or impression, that divine order is imprinted or impressed or stamped upon creation and the creatures within creation to show the parameters within which we must operate. It is imprinted or impressed upon us. It is contracted, stamped upon us. If we operate outside of those parameters that are impressed upon us, then we set ourselves up to be eradicated just like cancer cells. If they operate outside of the parameters that were stamped or impressed upon them by the forces of contraction, impression, divine hate, if you obviously operate outside of those parameters, then the immune and lymphatic systems in the body, the hate vehicles in the body will isolate the cancer cells, kill them, and expel them from the body to preserve the integrity of the body. The male and female forces of divine immunity and the lymphatic system in the great divine body of Heru, Bedeti, and Sekhmet, called Bena and Abena and Akan. These are the male and female forces of divine hate, contraction, where you have the divine forces of law, ma'a, and ma'at. And we're the first, of course, to show 
that the male deity Ma'a is a force in nature that we invoke and communicate with. He shows himself, communicates, possesses, operates through divination and so forth, guides us along the path. Ma'a and Ma'at are the male and female forces of divine law that undergirds all of creation. If you're aware of Ma'at and have no understanding of Ma'a, then you don't have an understanding of one half of the divine law that undergirds all of creation. Those who have been engaged in misinformed practices and beliefs, calling them quote-unquote comedic and so forth, yet they don't understand or never heard of the divinity Ma'a, it shows the bankruptcy of the practices that they have been propagating for decades in some instances. So we show who Ma'a is. We show him in the pyramid texts. We show him in the Runu Pert and Heru. We show him in late period texts. And we also show him in the Yoruba tradition, the Akan tradition, the Vodun tradition, and so forth. We never stop invoking him as well as Ma'at nonstop. So these are things that we deal with. We show that Madanichi, divine law, love, and divine hate are the two poles of divine order. This is information that's always been the manifestation of our culture, but we brought it forward. Other people have not brought this information forward. We're showing the distinctions between the institution-building efforts that we have put forward, what we bring to the Oman, what we bring, quote-unquote, to the table. We have the Okra, Okra complex, the soul of Akanfo, talking about the nature of the Ka and Kayet, called Okra and Okrawa and Akan, the soul, the divine consciousness, as a deity that dwells in the head region, assigned to us to dwell in our head region. A male divinity is assigned to dwell with you in your spiritual head by the supreme being if you're a male, Afurakani male, only, of course, a female deity. She is assigned by the great mother Aminette, to dwell with the head of the Afraikani female to guide her throughout the course of her life. These are the head divinities. The soul is actually a deity that guides us, that we communicate with, that we do divination with and so forth. We learn directly from who guides us throughout the course of our lives. We show that information. We show the cosmology. We show the etymologies. We show the connections between the Akan, the culture of ancient Kemet, as well as the Yoruba tradition, and Bodun as well. We go into detail about that. That is a groundbreaking work to show the nature of the soul, the nature of the divine function that we have, that fourfold division, sim similar and in structure to the cerebral cortex with its right and left hemispheres and the, cere uh, the cerebellum with its right and left hemispheres. We have the male and female aspects of our divine function and the male and female aspects of the motive power that we will to execute that divine function. We go into detail about that in the Okra Okra complex. We have our book, Oba Sign, Afurakani Womanhood, and the complimentary book, Oberima Afurakani Manhood. Seven sections, seven principal values of manhood and womanhood in each book, based on the abosom, the forces in nature that animate the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies which govern the seven day week and all natural cycles. So every principal value of manhood is associated with the force in nature. Therefore, this collection of seven principal values for manhood and womanhood in these two books, in, in each of the seven sections, every single day of the week, there's a divinity that governs that day. The energy of the divinity bathes the earth on that day and so forth and influences the earth on that day. And you have a principal value of manhood and womanhood to adhere to and align yourself with prominently on that day. It's a manual for manhood and womanhood that permeates all aspects of life. And of course, we have our Obedima workshops, manhood workshops based on the book, the Oba Sign, Afroikani Womanhood workshops based on the book. We will be having that um, retreat one month from today in February on Edisto Island, the Gullah Island in South Carolina, where we'll be having the Obedima Manhood Workshop, the Obasan Womanhood Workshop, as well as others. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the show. But this is um, part of that unique approach that builds up our Amaniye, our nationism, and our approach to nation building. We have Nkwamua Whole Life Journal, dealing with different aspects of holistic living and so forth. We've utilized this in 
utilize this text along with our, with our whole life interventions therapeutic model for those who are therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, therapists, social workers, case managers, anybody in the field of human services or working with clients. We have an Afura whole life interventions uh, model, which is a therapeutic model to convey culture. We deal with physical soundness and spiritual soundness from the root of culture and so forth. It's an approach to address the whole life of the individual. So Nkwamua Whole Life Journal deals with uh, certain um, aspects of that, that therapeutic model. You can use the journal as a manual when you're utilizing that therapeutic model to um, inform and empower your clients. So that's the reason we put that journal out. And we've done trainings with behavioral health professionals, and they've utilized that in their practice and continue to do so. We have our book, Who Do People? Afurakanu Afurakanu Africans in North America, Akan Custodians of Hudu from Ancient Hudu, Undunu Land, Kanit Nubia. Once again, as you will see in the text, we are the first to prove that the term Hudu comes from the Akan term Undu, which means medicine from roots, trees, plant life, root medicine, root work, and so forth. It also means to become heavy, to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession. We show that that term also exists in ancient Kemet and Kanat. Undu means medicine from roots, trees, plant life, and so forth. It also means to become heavy. Heavy with the spirit, Undu also means the ritual offerings that we give to the deities, the Undu. A title of ancient Kanit or Nubia is called the Undu land, and the people are called the Undu people. So we show that direct connection from ancient Kanit, the Khan people being called Undu people, to West Afuraka, Afuraka, the Akan people, utilizing Undu, and then in North America, the Akan ancestral religion in North America is Undu or Hudu. It is not a mixture of different African practices and African-American folk magic. It's not a mixture of pseudo-Native American folk magic and European folk magic with uh, amalgamation of African practices and, uh, and a cobbling together. That is totally inaccurate. Hudu is a full-fledged religion with deities and ancestral spirits. It is the Akan religion in North America, period. When we were forced from the continent, we brought our ancestral religion as Akan people to North America, and we continue to call it Hudu or Hudu, as well as Kanche, which is white in our spring thought. We were saying Kanje or Kanje. We were saying Kanche, which means to utter incantations to bring forth the spirits of the deities and ancestral spirits, the term Kanche exists in the Akan language, of course. We also show in the hieroglyphs the Medutu that Kanche has the exact same meaning in the language of ancient Kanit and Kemet. So in that publication, we go into detail about that, proving the Akan identity of the Hudu tradition. In our book, More Means Dead, once again, when you study the information and compare it to everything that has ever been written about the topic, we are the first and only to properly show the etymology of the term more, and more means dead. It means physically dead, talking about those who have died and those who are earthbound spirits in a negative existence. It also means the socially dead, talking about slaves, vassals, bondsmen, and so forth. It was always a derogatory term. The whites and their offspring recognize that we utilize that term, mer, as a derogatory term for those who are enslaved or bound, including bound through sickness, affliction, disease, but also bound as slaves and vassals and servants and bondsmen, and also those who are dead. And in their death, they were bound to earth, earth-bound spirits, not able to move forward to the ancestral realm and live in peace, but they were bound and suffering as discarnate spirits. They were mad. And physically in the world, those who are mad, who are bound, slaves, vassals, servants, and so forth, and also afflicted with disease and suffering, mad, the whites in our spring decided to utilize that term, mad, they corrupt into more for all black people, calling all of us slaves, afflicted, bondsmen, worthless, and so forth. They use one of our terms that we use in a derogatory fashion to identify a derogatory, a group in a derogatory fashion, and they expanded that to include all of our people. We go into detail to show the cosmological foundation of the term more, all the various terms that you see in the Medutu, the Hieroglyphic Dictionary, 
all these seven major definitions of the term mer, we show how all seven are pulled together through the cosmology. So these foolish, ignorant pseudo-linguists and pseudo-scholars who see different definitions and think you're just picking one or two out of seven, we show in our book the cosmological foundation and how all seven are tied together and support the reality and confirm the reality that more means dead. That is an irrefutable reality. And nothing that anybody can say, has ever said, or ever will say will change that reality. This is why when the book was released, it went viral, hundreds of thousands of downloads. We have destroyed that foolish, nonsensical, Moorish, foolish movement and the stupidity that has come from their pseudo-doctrine. That's what more means that has done. Our book, Anidaho, means awareness. It's a series of articles that we published. People had begun to put forth this foolish notion that the term nigger or nigger comes from a mistranslation of a term nganga or ganga ur or nganga ur. Brainwashed individuals who want to continue to call themselves nigger started saying, well, nigger is in the hieroglyphs, which is pure stupidity. Pseudo-scholars, pseudo-elders jumped on top of that and began doing speeches and going around the country trying to make people believe that nigger was a divine word and had to do with our spiritual constitution and energy. And even though it became corrupted by the whites and our spring, it's actually our word, pure stupidity. So we show the etymological origin, the cosmological foundation of that term ganga ur in H. Kemet, as well as nganga ur. And, of course, that's related to and manifest in the Bakango languages, Nganga, and so forth. We show that in detail. We actually show the etymological origin of the term nigger from the term nigger, from the term nek, the Proto-Indo-European root nek, nekka, which means in ancient Kemet, foes or enemies who are crushed or beaten to death. So we've always utilized that term for the foes or enemies who are crushed or beaten to death. The whites and offspring saw that we were utilizing that terminology, and once again, they took a term that they knew we used for enemies and those who are worthless and decided to paint all of our people with that. It's no different than if we use the term crackhead to designate someone who is high on crack and addicted to crack. And then a white person comes into the neighborhood, sees that everybody uses the term crackhead to identify that individual who is addicted to crack. And they say, okay, that's what a crackhead is. They write that down. And then they go back and they start calling all black people crackheads because they want to identify us in a negative fashion. That's what they did with the term nekka, which we were already using. And it's in the medu to the hieroglyphs. We show that and so forth. We show the term nehesu, ngesu, in Amharic, nkosu, in ancient Kemet, nkesu, as well as nkosu, in Akan, is a title of heteru, as a matter of fact, Nhesu or Ngesu Nkosu is not negus. Negus is not the origin of the term nigger. That's pure stupidity. And then we show Ra Aka is a title of Ra, which we find in the Book of the Cow of Heaven. Ra Aka, sometimes written Ra Ku, but Ra Ka becomes Ra Ka or Ra Nka or Danka or Edanga or Enanka in Akan in Ghana. Danga in Akan and Ivory Coast, that's where you get Naga from. Naga is not the origin of the term nigger. Nigger coming from nigger, coming from neck, neck, which means lack or want or need and so forth, poverty and, and lacking or wanting. But that neck comes from neck and neku from ancient Kemet, which we show means foes or enemies who are crushed or beaten to death, weak, negative, wanting, lacking, suffering, debilitated all of that. So we go into detail about that. So fools who are talking about it comes from the hieroglyphs, or it's coming from negus, or nigga comes from naga. Pure stupidity. So we destroy all of that with actual real scholarship. We have our book, Kokobo, which means warning. There's about seven texts that the whites and their offspring, when they were scouring all the texts from ancient Kemet over the course of thousands of years and thousands of texts, they pulled out about seven, which they tried to say represented an embrace of this sexuality. They weren't able to put that forward. They took about four of them 
and said these represent um, the embrace of dissexuality, homosexuality, and ancient Kemet. They've been running that lie ever since. And some of our people embrace that because they're brainwashed, and you have some Negroes who claim to be uh, well-versed in the traditions of ancient Kemet and the language and the culture, but when it came to these different texts, they had no answer for it because they don't know anything about the cosmology. So they started repeating things that the whites and offspring were saying and then started, started trying to add other definitions like, well, it's part of an esoteric science and you have to be initiated to understand the symbolism, but it's not really saying that, but it is because they really don't know what they're talking about. These pseudo-scholars, pseudo-spiritualists, pseudo-elders, and so forth. So we show in four different articles that we compile in this book these actual texts that the whites and their offspring put forward, and we give the proper translations and show that not only do these texts not support dissexuality, homosexuality, they actually repudiate dissexuality, homosexuality in detail. And we give proper translations that the whites and their offspring either did not understand or decided not to properly translate because they wanted to put forth the idea that dissexuality was acceptable. For example, with Neon Kanum and Kanum Hatep, these are identical twins. The whites in their offspring said they were the first gay couple. That's why they would be holding hands and, and you know, hugging each other. Yet when you look at the term for twins, Hata and Enchi Kemet, it means those who are conjoined. They were conjoined in the womb and they're conjoined in life. They're named after the deity Kanum or Kunwimu. He's the one who conjoins the soul and the body as twins on his divine potter's will and fuses them together inside the womb. So they're named after him, Neon Kanum and Kanum Hatep. These two twins are named after the deity who conjoins the twin soul and the body on the divine potter's will. They're named after him. And if you look at the term Hatar, the term for twins in ancient Kemet, the Medusu shows not only the phonetic symbols for Hatar, but it also shows the determinative of two men, two um, people holding hands because they're conjoined in the womb and they're conjoined through life. And, of course, the term hata, meaning twins, becomes ata and ata, the male and female term for twins in Akan. That's just one example. And then we show other texts, the instructions of pata, hatep, that proper translation showing it's a prepubescent sexual taboo. It's not um, a promotion of dissexuality. That destroys what the whites and offspring have been saying for decades and also the misinformation being propagated by pseudo-scholars, pseudo-Afrocentric scholars in the black community who promote themselves as knowledgeable, but when certain questions such as these texts come up, they never understood the cosmology. They had no answer when they were challenged about these texts, so they manufactured some foolish response trying to pretend like it was something esoteric that you had to go into some initiatory process to understand, which is pure stupidity. They just wouldn't admit that they didn't know what they were reading because they didn't understand the cosmology, because they're really not involved in ancestral religious practice and don't know who these deities are. When you know who Kunwimu is because you invoke that divinity, then you have an understanding of his function and creation, and you can see exactly what's going on. So we have our book, Nyonkompon, Nyonkonton, Ra and Ra'et, showing that Ra and Ra'et manifests as Nyonkompon and Nyonkonton, the creator and creatress in the Akan tradition, proving that conclusively, Many Akan academics who have matriculated through universities who were infected by white culture, even though they still speak the language and live on the continent and so forth and were raised there, they believe falsely that Inyame is the great monotheistic god and the various names, Inyokumpon, Odomakumpon, Tridriampong, and so forth, are all just titles of the great god, which is totally inaccurate. Inyame is the great god. Inyame was the great goddess. We show that and prove that in our publications, in Yonkumpon and in Yonkumpon, the creator and creatress are grandchildren of the supreme being. We show that in the cosmology. In our next book, Odomankoma and Tridrian Pong, we show that Odomankoma is Atumokopa, or Atimukopa, Atim Kepra in ancient Kemet. Tridrian Pong is Cherera, or Kepra in ancient Kemet. We go into detail about that. We have our groundbreaking book, Ah, the origin of the term yoga, and, so, and those two previous books, once again, were bringing ancient, authentic Akan ancestry religion, the tradition as it was practiced prior to European infection, prior to Christian, Islamic, monotheistic um, 
infection, the stupidity of monotheism, we show the real information. We have always been polytheistic. Negro apologists who are scared to say we're polytheistic because they fear the whites in their offspring, and the whites in their offspring have made them believe that monotheism is superior and polytheism is primitive, so they're scared to admit it because they're still mental slaves, so they manufacture all kinds of contorted definitions and expressions to pretend like we've always believed in the one true God, pure stupidity. There's a great God, there's a great goddess, and there are many, many gods and goddesses whom we invoke. When you're actually engaged in invoking these deities, you would never walk around talking about there's only one God, that, God that's pure stupidity. And it's based in fear of the whites and their offspring, an enslaved mind. The Ntoru, Ntoru to the deities of ancient Kemet, misnomer Neteru and Netertu, are gods and goddesses. This is polytheism. We have our book, Ankh, the origin of the term yoga, Karakasa, the origin and nature of the chakra. Once again, when you study the text, you'll see that we prove which no author, black or white, has shown the origin of the term yoga coming from the proto-Indo-European term yuk, yunk, which means to tire, to bind, and so forth. We show that yunk comes from yank or ankh, and it's actually shown the ankh around the neck of the sacred animal in the form of a yoke, and this is where yoke comes from. You see the ankh in the form of a yoke around the neck of the animal. That's where yunk or yoka and yoka comes from and so forth. We go into detail about that. We show the connections in the Akan tradition with the ankh and the akua badal and so forth, and that's the same hoodoo doll baby in the hoodoo tradition in North America. We also prove conclusively that the term kara kara is found in the language of ancient Kemet, and the cosmological foundation of Karakara, which is corrupted into chakra or kakara by the Hindus and so forth, they learned that term from our people. It is woven in our cosmology, and we show that in the text of Kemet, not only the term itself in the Medusa, the hieroglyphs, but it's woven in the cosmology of the culture. This is one reason why this particular book is one of the top downloads. At least a thousand um, copies of this book is downloaded on a monthly basis because of the detailed information that we find. Now, some fools who try to pretend like, you know, the terms didn't exist in the language, but we lay all of the information out in detail, exposing their ignorance as well as the misinformation of the whites and their offspring and the pseudo-religious practices of Jainism and Taoism and Buddhism and all of that nonsense. We show the actual origins of real ritual practice and how it's corrupted into these pseudo-practices that have no ritual or spiritual value at all. No matter how you try to blacken them up, try to pretend as though Buddha is a black man, which he had never existed. He's a corruption of Pataz that we're about to talk about. Mahavira never existed. Jainism, Buddhism, Taoism, all these different isms in the East are perverse corruptions of truncated fragments of our traditions. When you have a real tradition, you can see the corruption. When you're not practicing a real tradition and you've embraced the white, corrupt, perverted fragments and try to blacken up those fragments and make them a tradition, then you hold on to that nonsense, thinking that you're teaching something when you're teaching nothing. And we prove that in the text. This is why it's one of the top um, texts downloaded. We have our Patah Satsatim curriculum. We show Patah, the deity Patah, the great fashion of creation. Of course, he was corrupted into Puda or Buddha in the East and so forth, that Patah Satsatim is an educational curriculum for youth and adults. We have our Mate Masie, the ancestorhood of Nana Yao. Bob, Dr. Bobby e. Wright, we show that um, seven principal values of ethical existence manifest through the Adinkra symbols in our Khan tradition, and then we compare that with the thoughts and formulations of Dr. Bobby E. Wright, who was a black nationalist uh, psychologist who transitioned back in the 80s. I used to work at the Dr. Bobby E. Wright Behavioral Health Center in Chicago, and this is when I decided and was directed by the Insamanfo to write a book that showcased what he was teaching in relation to the ancient wisdom and so forth. This is where the Mate Mate comes from. We have our Hoodoo Mind, Hoodoo Nation Festival Journal, Volume 1, also Volumes 2 and 3, based on our Hoodoo Mind, Hoodoo Nation Festival. The Hoodoo Mind, Hoodoo Nation Festival occurs in October, three weeks after our New Year celebration, um, around the third weekend in October, and it's a showcase of Akan ancestral religion in North America. The Hoodoo Mind Journals have articles about the Hoodoo tradition, 
We're showing Undu comes from the Akan language. Uh, mojo comes from the Akan language, the Akan term Moja. The term Jack is in Jack Ball comes from the Ja term. Of course, we did our article and, and publication and broadcast on Njama, King Jama, like Njama, who they call King John or High John the Conqueror, and Akwamu Akan Royal, who was enslaved in the Western Hemisphere. His spirit went into the Njama or Jama plant. And of course, this is the root. High John the Conqueror is actually the root ginger originally, which is the same name and so forth, called Kakaru. And this is why. Jama Kakaru or King Njama or High Njama Kakaru became John the Conqueror Root or Conqueror Root and so forth. We go into detail about that in Volume 3 of the Hoodoo Mind Hoodoo Nation Festival. So we have the Hoodoo Mind Hoodoo Nation Festival publications, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, based on those, the third three conferences that we've had over the past three years. In the Kemet Hina in Toro book, The Black Nation and Divinity, we show the Etymological origin of the term Kemet, its cosmological foundation, and its identity, the same term in the Akan language with the same meaning and also designating a certain group of Akan people. Same meaning. And then we show the term Ntoro, which means deity, misnomer Netur, but it's Ntoro, it's vocalized as Ntoro in Akan. We show the term in the language of ancient Kemet. We show the origin, etymological breakdown, and its cosmological foundation in ancient Kemet, and in the Akan language as well. So the term Ntoro in Akan is the term Ntoro, or quote-unquote Netter, in ancient Kemet, and we prove that conclusively. And once again, we are the first to prove that information with Kemet and the term Ntoro. Once again, you have Akan priests and priestesses, not only in the Western Hemisphere, in the Caribbean, in North America, South America, the Caribbean, and so forth, but also priests and priestesses on the continent whose practice of the culture has been infected with Christianity and Islam and white culture in general, others who have matriculated through universities on the continent who were born and raised there as well as people who have migrated there or repatriated there and so forth. Their presentation of the culture has been infected by white culture and therefore they have not been able to see this information. But when you have a foundation in the actual religious practice that's not tainted, like Christianity, Islam, white culture, you're dealing with these actual divinities on a consistent basis. We know who these deities are. This is a hoodoo analysis we can show because when we left the continent 300 years ago, the way the tradition was being practiced then is what was fossilized in our bones and blood and brought to this hemisphere, and that expression of the tradition was passed down intergenerationally and transcarnationally to our descendants, including us. So we receive that pure, uncut tradition that we continue to practice. That's the hoodoo tradition as well as the juju tradition, which is Yoruba in North America, the voodoo tradition, the Ebe and Fon tradition in North America, the wanga tradition, which is Ovambo in North America, the Grigri tradition, which is the Bambara tradition in North America, and so forth. The Ngangan tradition, which is the Bang tradition, the Nganga tradition, which is the Bakango, the Golan Kisi traditions, the Golan Gichi, and so forth. We brought those pure traditions here the way they were practiced before the corruption. So what we pass down is a pure tradition, including priesthoods and priestesses fully intact. Juju men, juju women are priesthoods and priestesses in the juju tradition. Hudu men and hudu women, kanja men and kanja women, the priests and priestesses in the tradition, and so forth. Wanga men, wanga women, voodoo men, voodoo women, all these different classes of priests and priestesses. These are priests and priestesses, these orders that have been maintained intergenerationally and transcarnationally here in the Western Hemisphere. And therefore, we have access to the, uh, the deities that were born with us, assigned to us by the Supreme Being pre-incarnation, and our direct blood ancestresses and ancestors who founded these traditions and continue to guide us. We have direct insight into the nature of these symbolic representations, the language and so forth, and we put it forward, and we prove it. And the only fools who would try to deny it are those who have been misinforming people for years, have put themselves forward as experts for years of having some measure of expertise in ritual practice or cosmology or anthropology or linguistics or some other field of endeavor, and they've been misinforming people for years or having debates with people online and having video debates and all this kind of nonsense. 
and people see them as elders or elders or spiritualists or scholars or whatever they would like to call themselves, then our publication comes out and destroys everything they've been talking about for the past 10, 15, 20, 30 years. So they're embarrassed, they're fearful, they panic, they don't want to lose their little following. So they would rather, rather pretend like the information isn't accurate and hope that the people listen to them as opposed to go and study the book. They'll try to get people to not read the book. We've had individuals who are so-called elders, elderses, so-called priests and priestesses, PhDs, and others who try to dissuade people from actually reading the book, trying to keep them from reading this book and others. Because they know if they actually read it, it exposes the fact that these individuals never knew what they were talking about all along. So they try to dissuade people from actually reading the text. That's another valuable um, result of having your books online for free. Because if they were, everything was, had a price to it, and a PhD or an elder or an elderess or a priest or a priestess said, hey, you shouldn't read that book because there's misinformation in that book and this person doesn't understand the culture and so forth, and then it had a price tag on it as well, you might say, well, I might as well not waste my money then. But when the book is free and the people are telling you, well, don't download that free book, just listen to me, but don't download the free book. I've had some people telling me their quote-unquote bottle out forbade them to read the text and so forth because they knew if they read it, it would be over. And that's exactly what has happened on numerous occasions over the years. People end up reading the text, find out that they're Baba, Iya, Nana, or whoever, their elder, elders, PhD, whoever it is, never knew what they were talking about, and then they separate from them. And that's what the pseudo-scholar or elder or spiritualist or so-called expert feared all along. That's true with this book as well as other books as well. We have our Etchy Sign books, volumes one and two, that we published for the conference that have articles on ancestral religious reversion. But also we have uh, the third annual conference coming up in March. These books have articles on that as well as the presenters that come to the conference Etchy Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion is dealing with our ancestral religious practices that we have maintained in our blood circles here in North America. So we have different people speaking at the conference, the all-day conference, once again, a free conference um, from the different traditions, the Juju tradition, which is Yoruba, the Akan tradition, which is Hudu, the uh, Voodoo tradition, which is Evi and Fon, the Wanga tradition, which is the Ovambo, different traditions coming together. We maintain these traditions in our blood circles in North America. There's a resurgence. This is etchy sign, ancestral religious reversion. When someone tries to convert you into something, they're trying to convert you into something that otherwise you would normally not embrace, so they have to convert you into a fake religion. We deal with the reversion, etchy sign. Etchy means back and sign means return. Etchy sign means ancestral religious reversion. We're reverting back to our original pristine state that ancestral religious tradition that was wired within us by the supreme being before we even entered into the womb. Based on the deities that were assigned to us and the ancestral clans, we were ushered into so that we can come into the world and carry that energy complex within the world and operate according to that energy complex as we interface with this region of the Earth Mother in the Western Hemisphere. So this is what we're dealing with with Etchi Sign, all volumes one and two. And, of course, um, volume three will be released in March at the third annual conference. We have our book, Rekit Hena Speret, Etymology and Cosmology of Religion and Spirit. Once again, when you study this text, you'll find that no white scholar, no black scholar, and you, you make the comparisons, you get other texts that have been written by white scholars on this subject for cent- over a century, look at what other black scholars have written, and then you look at what we've written and compare. We show the etymology of the term religion, the etymology of the term spirit, the cosmological foundation of these terms. We show them in the language of ancient Kemet. Religion and spirituality is identical. It is fake religion that is not identical or it's not congruent with spirituality. So this notion that I'm not into religion, I'm into spirituality is nonsense coming from the whites and their offspring. When they corrupted real religion, then they left the corruptions alone and tried to begin to corrupt spirituality, manufacturing this 
unconditional love nonsense and promoting this sexuality and everything else. They're corrupting religion and spirituality. Religion and spirituality is identical. Different aspects of the same reality. So we go into detail about that in this publication. We have our Ojidaman Afashe. Ojidaman is the purified nation. Afashe means festival. So we have our conference, the Purified Nation Conference. We focus on Amaniye Nationism, the purification of nationalism. We have that in June around the solstice, just like we have Echisan and such religious reversion in March around the equinox. We have Ujidamain, the hot time of the year, the fullness of the year, time for nation building, nationism, and so forth. So this Ujidamain book, volumes one and volume two from the first two conferences, and then Volume 3 is, will be released this June around the solstice in our third annual OGDMI conference. So we have three annual conferences. We have the Hudu Mind, Hudu Nation Festival in October, three weeks after the, um, our New Year's Day, which is the autumn equinox, September 22nd or September 23rd, depending on the year. We have the Hudu Mind, Hudu Nation Festival, the only festival of its kind showcasing Akan ancestry religion manifest as hoodoo in North America, different presenters and so forth. We always have a marketplace of Afurakani, Afurakani vendors throughout the course of the day so you can shop in our Egwa marketplace and so forth, learn about the culture from the different presenters, having, um, you know, vegan food and so forth. It's always a free conference open to our people only. That's in October around the spring equinox three weeks after the autumn equinox, then in March, near the spring equinox, we have Etchi Sign and Sustry Religious Reversion. We also have a marketplace, all-day event, presenters from the different traditions, born of our blood circles here in North America, and such religious traditions. And then around the summer solstice, we have Oji Raman, the Purified Nation Conference, Apurakani, Apurakani people in the Western Hemisphere, where we deal with Amanie nationism, nation building, seven principal values of nation building, and so forth. This is where this book comes from. Then we have volume one and two of Akradin Bosom. We have Bosom, the deities, the Akana Bosom deities that govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies, which animate the seven-day week. We just did a broadcast about that last night. We have volumes one and two, and we're coming out with volume three very soon, within weeks, and then volumes four, five, and six. These different deities that male and female divinities that animate the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern the seven-day week, Akan people, ancient Akan people, ancient Kani people, created and established that seven-day week based on these natural cycles and recognizing these natural cycles and documenting that. We took that around the continent. We also took it when we migrated into the Near East and so forth. This is why Akan people still have the seven-day week. We are the first to prove out of any white scholar or any Ghanaian or Ivorian scholar and so forth, that the deities of the seven days of the week are the exact same deities, not only in ancient Sumer, but also in ancient Kanit and Kemet, with the same names, the same functions, the same ritual colors, the same descriptive titles operating through the same celestial bodies in Akan as they do in ancient Kanit and Kemet because they're the same deities, and we prove that. So once again, you have individuals, some who pretend like there were no deities of the seven days of the week, and we're just named after the days, with the names like Kwame and Kojo and Kwesi and Akosui and Kofi and Afu and so forth, we're just named after the different days. Some understand that there are deities that govern the seven days of the week, but they do not know who these deities are because of the corruption of Islam and Christianity over the past couple of hundred years. It has dumbed down the culture, so many of the individuals don't know who these deities are, specifically the ones who put themselves forward as experts, whether they're linguists, scholars, or Okomfo, or Abosomfo, or Osofo, or different forms of priests and priestesses. They have a tainted, infected culture, and they're putting forward that infection. So once again, when they put themselves forward as spiritualists, or scholars, or elders, or elderesses. And then our text comes forward and exposes the reality in excruciating detail, meticulous detail. Then once again, they panic because they realize 
that they've been exposed for not knowing what they're talking about for decades. And then their followers begin to question, if you didn't know this, then what else have you been teaching us all these years, which will turn out to be totally inaccurate. So they start losing support. So some of them will, once again, try to forbid people from studying the work, which is insane. This is the kind of pathology we have in the community where Negroes will try to forbid people from reading the text, even though the texts are free, because they don't want to expose the fact that they never knew what they were talking about, even though they've been promoting themselves as experts, elders, elders, spiritualists, and so forth. But the Akradin Bosom theory destroys all of that, destroys their misinformation, but also destroys their fragile egos and that emotional instability they manifest. We have volumes one and two, and three, four, five, and six are coming very soon. We also have our book, one of the newest books released, Tuhuti, Sankofa, Fa, and Ifa, The Male Deity of Divine Wisdom and Divination in Kemet, Akan, Ebe, Fon, and Yoruba. We found the Sankofa symbol, the full Sankofa symbol in ancient Kemet. We show that it is the Sankofa symbol is the symbol of Het Heru. And then we also show, show Tehuti and Seshat in the form of those male and female tech birds, the Sankofa birds, the Habwi birds in the form of the tech birds and so forth as they interface with Het Heru in the womb region and so forth. We show the Sankofa symbol. We show that Tehuti is the deity Sankofa, Seshat is Sankofa Wa and so forth. We show the identity of Sankofa in Akan, Fa in the Vodun tradition, Ifa in the Yoruba tradition. We go into detail about that to show who this deity is functioning in the culture. That's groundbreaking work once again that until we published it, people had no idea about that information. So those are the different books that we have published, that we've released over the past few years. Again, we have, this is just a summary of the publication that we will have out. This first 29 doesn't even scratch the surface, so we have many more books coming out and so forth. That's what we bring to the online, the nation of quote-unquote bring to the table as part of our institution building process. We have Nanasom Feku or Nanasom Ancestral Religion Study Groups that people form on their own, not under our direction, but they go to our Feku page our Nanasom study group page. You get a 30% discount on the books that you order. If you start a study group with yourself and one other person, one or more people, whether it's in person or online, and people study the information and so forth, um, we have a no quadifo distributor option for those who would like to sell our books as distributors, independent distributors. You're not working for us. You're an independent um, independently employed, self-employed individual. You purchase the books from us wholesale and you sell them retail. So we're not just talking about information, but anyone who needs to generate income, needs to work and so forth, we have an option where they can begin to work immediately, notwithstanding their previous work history. We need to have solutions beyond teaching information that's accurate, that transforms people's lives physically and spiritually and culturally and so forth, but also tangibly, what can we do? Do we have an option for employment? And we have that option with our 29 books, and the books typically sell themselves. So when people show them and so forth and have them when they're reading at work or on the train or wherever they are, people see the book and see something saying Jesus never existed or Muhammad never existed or the origin of the term yoga or more means dead or whatever it is. When they see the book and they see the books are only 8 9 10 or $11, most of them are 9 and $10, then they sell themselves so people can begin to generate income right away. That's what we have with regard to our publications. Of course, we have our 300 broadcasts that we have put forward. Um, so that's on the publication side. We talked about our three annual conferences. When we do presentations around the country, once again, we always make them free. and They're always open to our people only. We always give away a free book to everyone who attends until, of course, we run out. Um, that's part of our process. We also recently um, 
have been in the pro- we, we've mentioned here in the broadcast the Akungwa Suya Institution of Learning, Healing, Training, Entrepreneurship. Um, that's part of our that's our Akungwa Suya institution. So when we're teaching, part of that institutional work is teaching online and so forth. It also has to do with the workshops. When we're having um, for a while in DC, we we're having an event every single month. In addition to the conferences around the equinoxes and the you know the solstice and so forth, we're having something on a monthly basis as well as going to different cities. Over the past few months, we hadn't had the monthly piece because we've been working on another major project, and that major project is Amaru Kafo Adebisa Ajumadi, African American Ancestral Divination Documentary Film. That's what we're working on. We started a crowdfunding effort for that one year ago. We're at 50 percent. We had a about 102 people now who have contributed over the past year. We're at 50% of our goal with 100 people, but there have been 177 contributions with 102 people. That's because some people have given more than once. What we're trying to do now, what we're working towards, and we can make this goal, is to reach the other 50% so that we can complete the filming within the next 30 days. Um, and then once we complete the filming and the editing piece, we can have it ready around the time of the March, the uh, spring equinox. That's our goal. So if you look at the work that we have been doing over the past few years and the publications we put out, if you've been impacted, then what you can do to support the work that we're doing, to support our crowdfund for the film. Now, we just put out a, a couple of posts with regard to that. We saw that there's an individual, a black man, working at a school. Uh, they decided that they wanted their children to see the Black Panther movie that's coming out next month. So they started a crowdfunding effort to get tickets, to purchase tickets for their children to see the Black Panther movie because they wanted to see black, quote, unquote, heroes. What many of them do not know is that there's a lesbian relationship amongst it within the Black Panther movie that's going to be showcased. That's the only reason Black Panther is being released, is to showcase this sexuality, homosexuality, and you have black people all around the country with money tightly held in their fists, falling asleep with the money in their fists, waiting for the next 30 days so they can give that money to white millionaires. And once they give those millions to white millionaires, what they're going to receive in return is a story of fictional superheroes and lesbianism, dissexuality, homosexuality, so it can be normalized. When young people go and see a bunch of special effects and martial arts and they're all excited about black people doing these things, that seems to be cool. And when they slide the lesbian story in there, then dissexuality will be normalized and quote-unquote cool. they like, well, if the Black Panthers in Africa accepted lesbianism, then it must be okay. This is the only reason the movie is being released. This is the only reason it's been put forward. It's political. It's psyops. It's warfare. It's intellectual warfare. It's spiritual warfare. The White Narrow Spring only put forward certain movies and television shows and so forth to constantly brainwash our people and control the minds of our people. So we're giving millions of dollars, can't wait to give millions of dollars to millionaires to receive not only misinformation of characters they manufacture, but also to normalize dissexuality, homosexuality in the minds of millions of our children all in the course of a weekend. Where else can you mass brainwash millions of black people all within the course of a week, a weekend or a couple of weekends, put it in a movie and have a great anticipation and have delays with the production of the movie and it was going to come out, then they had the delay and now they finally, it's going to come out and building all this anticipation. This individual raised $30,000 in five days in a crowdfunding campaign so he can get tickets to give to black kids to watch a movie about fictional superheroes and dissexuality. $30,000 in five days. Now, we did some calculation We've received about 14 contributions on a monthly 
basis over the course of 12 months, and that's 170 contributions in the course of a year. 14 contributions a month. At the same time, we have about 4,000 downloads of our books on a monthly basis. Over the past 12 months, we've had over 55,000 downloads of our free books. So you compare 4,000 books a month to 14 contributions a month, what is the disconnect between the two? The disconnect is actually addressed in our Okom Economic Development Model. Once we get back involved in our ancestral culture and transform our values and reform our values, we seek only to support that which empowers us and reject that which disempowers us. So we have a natural inclination when we return to ancestral religious culture, ancestral religious reversion, we revert to our culture, we have an instinct, a natural propensity, a natural inclination to support businesses and endeavors that empower our people. So when we have our crowdfunding effort, this is what we're talking about. So if you do support the information, if you've never had a chance, if you're not one of the 102 people who were able to give over the course of the past 12 months, but you have downloaded some books or you listen to some of the 300 broadcasts or they change your life with regards to diet or spiritual practice or transforming, overcoming addictions like we have our Akumasa, overcoming addiction through ancestral religious practices and the number of people who stop smoking and drinking and wasting money and destroying their lives with drugs and alcohol and so forth. They're not only saving money, but they're saving their lives, purifying their health. That's good for them. It's good for their children, good for their loved ones and so forth. Many people have done that through our process and so forth. If you've been impacted, we're going to ask everybody tonight, this is a 300th broadcast, to go to our Amaru Kapo Adebisa Ajumadi uh, fundraising effort on the fundraiser platform. We had a $5 challenge uh, for black business that we posted that before. If you normally spend a dollar ninety-nine cents every day, who are Arizona iced tea at work or something, Monday through Friday, sacrificing that particular $5 this week to support our crowdfund so we can get to that other 50%. It took us 12 months to get to 50%, but these Negroes raised $30,000 in five days. <clears throat> our goal is $16,000. we have raised eight in 12 months. We have the other eight. <coughs> excuse me, that we're trying to raise, we have enough people, a uh, 100 people or 200 people out of the 5,000 people we have on Facebook or the 4,500 subscribers we have on YouTube or the um, 1,000 people we have on Instagram or the 350 people who are following us on Blog Talk Radio on the channel. We have literally thousands of people who tune in, thousands of people download the books on a monthly basis. We have enough people where we can reach our goal within 24 hours. Just like they raised 30,000 in five days, we could raise 8,000 in 24 hours just on the people alone who have benefited from the work. If they can raise 30,000 for a film to finance white millionaires and perpetuate dissexuality, a film they haven't seen, surely the people who benefited from the thousands of downloads over the years, we can, you have a tangible benefit for that. Definitely we can support that. So, Yad, I say we thank everyone who has already um, contributed once or more than once and so forth, whether it was $5 or 10 or 100 or whatever it was. But for those who haven't had a chance to do so, tonight is the night. Three, 300 broadcast, Ahasa 300. Please go to the, the fundraiser page now. We'll put the link in the chat room right now. It's on our website, of course. On the, it's on the publications page on our website. It's on, our, um, on different pages on the website. It's also on our Facebook page. We'll put it in the chat room right now because we want to get the film completed as soon as possible. Okay, so we just placed it in the chat room. And again, we do have that. We do have the capacity. So we, we've got a, it's 1035. We want to take a, a call right quick on the phone line. 
Um, you chair on the phone line number 3667. You had a question or a comment? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, nice to speak with you tonight. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, when it comes down to, I understand it being the feminine and the masculine energy with Aminette. Aminette, Amin and Aminette. So I was wondering, when it comes down to marriage and potential couples, does, say for instance, the soul days that people are born on, does it generally, do you generally have to um, exist with someone who has the same soul day as you, or does that is that really relevant as long as it's a complimentary couple or right. No, no, you don't have, it, it's not um, that you have to have someone on the same soul day. People are um, on the same soul day. They have similar, you know, characteristics, but that's kind of like, for example, the most direct um, couple quote unquote on a soul day that has uh, almost identical characteristics are identical yeah. twins. So, because, you know, they can't come out on the same day. They both have the same soul name and so forth. Um, yes. But they're twins, okay. but they go off and they marry somebody else. So, okay. they, and it's the same thing with, you know, with us. Most people in the Akan tradition don't marry somebody on the, from the same uh, Prada or soul day. Some of them do, some of them don't. But it's, it's about your, your functioning creation, who you're drawn okay. to by Afi, Heheru, who fuses together complementary opposites in, in harmony and in order fusion and so forth. So, yes, it, it's not based on yeah. you have to have that same energy complex. Okay. And um, another question that i kind of been um, thinking on is I know that when it comes down to uh, currency and, and like, dealing with um, institutions and I just, I guess I could say just things as, it's futuristic as things start to change. Um, I hear a lot of people talking about, you know, uh, different types of money, you know, that, that is going to, I guess you could say, take people through the next cycles of, of time. And I was wondering with that, should, like, I, in a way, I feel like we should not worry about that, but all at the same time, if it was something that was beneficial for us to understand when dealing with finances and being able to uh, barter and trade with one another in companies and being able to just self-sustain ourselves, um, I mean, what do you think about that in general? Some people say gold, and then you hear the trend of the Bitcoin and, and different things like that. And I know that it's something, you know, of importance when it comes to being able to deal with currency. But I, I don't really, at this moment, understand. Is there any perspective that you could give on that subject or any thoughts? Well, well, I would say the important uh thing that needs to be acquired, and in our Khan tradition, they talk about all power emanates from Asase. All power okay. emanates from the earth. So okay. when we generate funds and part of that process, we have, you know, no quality for distributor option and so forth and talking about institution building, but part of that process is when we generate funds through our businesses of course, we support one another, but part of it is to set aside some funds to access land because everything comes from land. It comes, whether it's food, whether it's medicine, whether it's the raw materials to build not only edifices okay. but also machinery, machinery or whatever else and textiles for clothing and everything else, everything comes okay. from land. Black people okay. or poor black people trying to stack up, you know, gold bullions and, you know what I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> gold yeah. bricks. <laughs> or that's almost nonsensical. Black people sit, be sitting around, unless you have some extra money and you're following the market and, you, you know, you're just watching the wave and quickly you coming in and out. Um, 
white people can, you know, fix the, the price and they can make the thing crash. We shouldn't be dependent yeah. on, you know, the stock market to determine whether or not we're going to be wealthy or not unless people have some extra funds, some extra disposable income that they would have spent on, you know, something else, like some sure. initiatives or something, and they decide to do that just to see what happens. But that's not your – our all power emanates from the land. And it's the same okay. thing with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and so forth. You'll notice every few years, sometimes it's almost like every seven to ten years, there's mm-hmm. a new craze or some new investment option manufactured mm-hmm. by the whites and offspring but pushed on the black community and it flies through the black community, typically the low-income black community where people are struggling, the working class and so forth, and all these mm-hmm. promises are made that you can make this money. It's always some form of multi-level marketing or some form of investment and this is what you need and so forth. And a right. lot of people are jump, jump on it because we're struggling, we're suffering and so forth, and we, the idea that we might be able to break out of this nine to five, right. having one job or two jobs and still not making ends meet, we might be able to flip something. That's yeah. very attractive to the mind, and that's why the White House Room put it forward. You never okay. see anybody who's successful except maybe one cat just running around the country talking about, look what I did, and then they got... Yeah. 5,000 people coming out to a convention and he's the only cat who made any money and you still don't know if he really right. made the money based on that. So, sure. But the reality is when we change our mindset, that's why we have our Ocom economic development model. When you download that, when you transform the mindset, then we already have the resources we need to be able to access this land. There, as we said before, there are close to 2 million black people unemployed. There are nearly 2 million black businesses in America we spend over a trillion dollars in the course of a year when we change the mindset instead of spending 950 plus billion outside of the community and taking the other 50 billion and trying to keep it in black businesses. We're spending about $20 billion per week. We could spend, um, we could take 200 billion from the 950 we're given to the whites and their offspring. Mm-hmm. And we could, uh, or, or even we could take 10% of the $20 billion we spend on a weekly basis, or we just take 10% of that. We're spending $20 billion primarily with white businesses. If we took 10% of that $2 billion and redirected um, it to black businesses, meaning every black person took, took 10% of the money that they spend every week and deliberately took it, starved the beast and feed the pride, took it from a white business and directed it to a black business, that would shift. $2 billion from white businesses to black businesses in one every week. And that $2 right. billion dollars would allow those 2 million people to have a salary of $50,000 a year. So all 2 million black people could be hired, you know, at a 50000 a year salary instantly. Unemployment is over. Now, that's just mm-hmm. a calculation. But the key is if you change your mindset, we can pool resources with other individuals who are on the same path or simply supporting black businesses instead of supporting white business. Instead of all these black Mm -hmm. people giving millions of dollars to Black Panther, to these crackers who made Stan Lee and Jack Kirby who made this cartoon, made this comic, and then some black actors who are going to take the millions we give them and spend it with white businesses anyway, instead of flooding them with millions of dollars based on propaganda, all those millions could go to Nobody needs to see a movie. Nobody needs to spend millions of dollars and give it to white people. That's not like food and water. So all those millions could be directed specifically to black businesses and actually employ people permanently because we don't have that mindset. We're giving away all the money. We're suffering. And then we're looking for get-rich-quick schemes, which is nonsensical. So when we change the mindset, then everything else automatically changes. All you need is a good strategy. You have the inclination to support a black business. All you need is a good strategy, and that's why we have the Star of the Beast, Feed the Pride, one black business per week for 52 weeks. We um, reallocate funds away from white businesses, Star of the Beast, and Feed the Pride, and put them in the accounts of the black business. have 1,000 people doing that in one black business for a week. You take $10, you would have spent it at Chipotle or Starbucks and direct it to the black business in seven, in, during that seven-day period. If 1,000 people do that, that's a $10,000 infusion of cash in the black business, and they can hire a black person immediately. 
then you go to the right. next business the next week or the next one. We can do that just for the people who listen to the broadcast. So right. and transform lives that way. I understand. That and that makes um total sense. Uh I have one one last question and it is about um the marriage situation and it and it's about um fulfilling your functions and your destiny. And I was wondering, like I understand with the gods and goddesses that um they that pretty much they've lasted through the 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 years. I mean, thousands of years from my understanding. And with people who marry, my question is once you marry with somebody, like next life cycle or five life cycles down the line, do you link up with that same person or is it like a grow type thing and you grow through a phase with a person and then you may experience someone else since we are different from the gods and goddesses? Yeah, so sometimes you can. Sometimes it's about it's about what your function is. So if you carry a certain energy complex in the world, just like your cells, you you have different organs, and your body needs the energy of the liver, it needs the spleen, it needs the pancreas, and so forth. Yes. And cells have to be born within those organs to continue to execute all the functions in the body. And we are cells right. into the body of the supreme being. So if we're pancreas cells, we have to execute pancreas functions. If we come in as liver cells, we have to, and under the liver deity, quote unquote, who governs our head, we have sure. to execute those functions. So depending on our function, okay. that's how we incarnate into the world. Sometimes we will be drawn to somebody that we were connected to before, and sometimes it's a different function, so we have a different uh, need, and, and we connect with somebody else. But of course, okay. you know, the forces of nature, just like the Earth and the sun and the oceans and the rivers and the atmosphere and so forth are the same earth, sun, oceans, rivers, atmosphere, black substance of space that have been here for millions of years. The spirits that animate the suns and the stars and the planets and the black substance of space and the oceans and rivers and so forth, those spirits have been animating those aspects of creation for millions of years. Those are the forces in nature. And when we come into the world, we are impacted by them spiritually just like when we stand outside, we're impacted by the earth mother, the sunlight, the water, the oceans, and so forth. Our physical bodies yeah. are impacted by that just by existing. And we can take in the water and have a more intimate, you know, relationship or take in the sunlight in a certain way or take in the plant life, animal life, mineral life in a certain way with medicine and food and have a more deeper, con- intimate connection. In the same way, we can engage in ritual and pull in the energy and be possessed by the abosom that animate the sun or animate the moon or animate the planets or animate the earth, mother, rivers, oceans, and so forth. But, yes, these are the same forces in creation that animate us, that we interface with. And we, when we engage in that such religious uh, practice, we intensify that interaction we have so we can stay on track and we can see what we need to be doing and what we don't need to be doing and so forth. Mm-hmm. And that, that also allows us to see who we need to connect with and who we need not to connect with. Okay. Okay. Well, that that definitely answers all the questions that I had immediately, and um, I appreciate all that you do. Okay, Medasa, we appreciate the call. Thank you. Okay, so we um, those are good questions. So we have, um, we just have like around 10 minutes left before the broadcast cuts off. So once again, please go to the fundraiser.com, F-U-N-D-R-A-Z-R.com, slash Amadu Kafo underscore Adibisa for our um, film project. Once again, just like we were talking to with the sister, we can easily generate those funds. As a matter of fact, last year, um, back, I remember sending out an email in, in February. It was either February. No, it was actually around March. We sent out an email because the goal was we raised some funds, but then we had a, a large uh, chunk of the funds that were coming because, because of a tax refund and so forth, um, over $4,000. So that was going to help us, you know, do most of what we needed to do. And then because of a tax offset, uh, Department of Education took the entire $4,000 of tax refund. So we lost all of that. They've never done that before. It's the first time. So 
So it was too late to try to, you know, recoup it back. There was nothing we could do about that. So I remember sending out that email and saying, we have 3,741 subscribers on YouTube. Surely we can, you know, raise the funds to recoup that, you know, $4,000 loss because that would have really put us forward and much closer to the goal. We'll be at, we would have been at 75% already instead of 50%. Since then, now we have over 40, about 4,500 uh, subscribers, so we've had over 700 more people subscribe to the YouTube channel since then and downloading the videos and watching. Of course, that has something to do with the 4,000 books that are being downloaded on a monthly basis and the 55,000 in the past 12 months. So just from those additional 700 people or just the 4,500 people who subscribe on YouTube, some of you subscribe on the YouTube channel, even 10% of those people, if 4,000 people said, we're not going to contribute, we'll just watch the videos, but then 400, 10% of the 40, you know, 4,400 people with 440 people said, you know what, we're going to contribute, and the other 4,000, they just will not. That 400 people is enough to put us over um, the goal instantaneously, literally overnight. So we have enough people. It's just the mindset that we need. And when you think about, when you see the trailer of the film, watch the nine-minute trailer, look at the information. If you like what you see and you see this is something valuable, if it's something worth sacrificing $10 or 15 or 20 or whatever from a white business to our business, please go ahead and do that. And we, again, yet I say we appreciate the support we've, we've received. We've got one more call on the phone line, and then we'll be done. But it, okay, Michelle, we're on the phone line. Is there a question or comment? Yes, I have a comment. Um, damn, what else I said? Uh, Quasi, you know, like you said about these so-called doctors and so-called pseudo scholars like Bible Laos. Um, I noticed with a lot of them that they, they have a heavily influenced people to prevent them to really do any thorough looking and research, especially if they come across similar material like your work. And they will sit there, like you said, will try to persuade people not to even look at it, read it. Even to the point where some people that got these doctor degrees They'll look at people that do regular work that they, they will consider not validate because it seems like it's not coming from the white man. So, you know, I guess it does hold weight to what you said because it seems to me that if anybody's doing any work, it seems to me that they, they, you have to have seen validation from, a, from other races to prove to certain so-called black people that don't really look within their stuff or information. That's what I'm trying to play. Um, yeah. Absolutely. The reality is when it comes to ancestry, legend, and practice, ritual culture, and the nature of the Abosa, Marisha Vodou, and so forth, and Nsamafo, Egungun, Kuvita, the deities and ancestral spirits do not dwell in universities. They do not manufacture those white universities, even if those universities are universities on the continent of Afuraka, Afurakai, contemporary universities. They did not establish them. They do not dwell in them. Those are not shrines or temples for the deity. So anybody in the university is going to have to at some point leave the, the grounds of the campus and go to people who are actually practicing and being possessed by these divinities and these ancestral spirits and find out what's happening. Then they can go back in the university and report on what happened. But the people who actually know the experts are the ancestresses and ancestors of your direct blood circles, of our direct blood circles, and the de deities connected to us by blood. And since we still practice the traditions because we have inherited them intergenerationally and transcarnationally through successive reincarnations here in the Western Hemisphere and wherever we are, then we have real experts in the tradition. We don't pay any attention to some pseudo-scholar or some so-called elder or elderist or pseudo-spiritualist just because they've been through either a degree program or initiation on the continent in the Caribbean or here, that doesn't confer divine wisdom on anybody. The experts are in our blood circles. Nobody outside of our direct ancestral blood circle can instruct us on the tradition unless it's in harmony with what our ancestresses and ancestors direct us to. If it's out of harmony with that, the hell with these Negroes because they are not our elders, they're not our priests and priestesses, they are not anything to us. 
We have our own people within our own blood circles. Anything that does not jive with what our own people direct us to do, as well as the deities that we were born with direct us to do, to hell with those Negroes because they mean nothing to us. And they're beginning to understand that. Indeed, indeed. I think there's no other questions. Um, thank you again. Madasi. Okay. Any other that. Appreciate the call. And that's part of that's the thrust of etchy sign ancestral religious reversion. We are not dependent on anyone outside of our direct ancestral spirit genetic blood circle for our ancestral religious traditions. It's a misnomer that we didn't preserve our traditions in North America, and therefore we have to run around, whether it's to the Caribbean or the continent, to receive something to bring it back. That has never been true. We've been brainwashed into that belief. We still have that messianic mindset, that foolish messianic mindset where there's a Messiah that we're going to go to and they're going to lead us to the promised land. So we have to go follow someone and they can come and give us something and dispense some wisdom to us because we're just empty, ignorant vessels that have no value. That's nonsense. So we're destroying all of that foolishness. Okay, so we have one more call on the phone line. We have a couple of minutes left in the broadcast. We on the phone line number 9440. You had a question or comment? Hi, Brother Kwesi. This is a close where I um, was listening to the show, and you quoted a couple statistics that really caught my attention. Some of the information that I have been looking for for some time um, as I'm preparing to, to uh, resume our radio broadcast. I was wondering if you had, um, if that's just something that you have calculated yourself as it relates to um, the benefits of supporting black-owned business from a just kind of statistical economic basis. You know, you kind of gave some quotes of if we, um, you know, patronized our own businesses in this amount, you know, for this period of time, then it would ultimately result in this benefit. You kind of quoted a couple of salaries and things of that nature. I just wondered if you had some more information on that or uh, if that's something that I could uh, could get access to. Well, now, with regards to how much we could save with the $20 billion a week and so forth. Um, yeah, yeah, you, that you was just kind of rattled them out kind of quick, and I didn't – I heard them, obviously, but um, I was just really intrigued and wondered what the source was and if there was a way I could access some of that information. Well, now, now with regards to the calculations of how much we would need to generate, you know, 50000 a year for 2 million people, that was just a calculation. Mm-hmm of, you know, um, breaking that down. But as far as the how much we spend on a yearly basis, the over $1 mm-hmm. trillion, sometimes some will say $1.1 trillion, moving through our hands, and about 95% of that. There are certain black firms that do that analysis on a, on a yearly basis. One of them, I believe, is Target Marketing Corporation. There are a few black firms that put those numbers out for uh, black consumption, Yearly and so okay. forth. So if you just, I think, mm-hmm. I think Target Market Corporation is one of them. Um, okay, I will send you an email. I, I can send. Okay, okay, I appreciate it. May I say? Okay. Any other that? Okay, so we only have a few uh, seconds left. Well, a minute, less than a minute left in the broadcast. So we're going to end the broadcast here. Yet I say we thank everyone for tuning into this 300th broadcast. And, you know, listening and supporting all these broadcasts over the past few years, the, the books and so forth, and the conferences and the presentations, and we're moving into this next phase where we're going to have our first film. And, of course, this will be the first film, but we will have others as well. So we have information in print, information in audio as far as the, you know, broadcast and so forth, and then that which is visual as well as communal events where people come together on a regular basis. We're hitting all areas. We also have, we should have mentioned, our Hapi Merit training cultural and ritual retreat on a Destu Island, the Gullah, one of the Gullah Islands in South Carolina, um, coming up in February 16th weekend. We have a few uh, spaces left for that if you would like to um, get on that as well. So contact us. Again, Yerase, we thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. And Yerbeshi Abio, we will meet again. That's it.